If you are trying to navigate the chaos of this business journey, when it comes to your market research, when it comes to selling, when it comes to marketing, when it comes to delivering for clients, you're not alone. And definitely the journey can bring uncertainty, doubt, fear, worry, concerns, what I call all the good stuff. And that's why we have Monica Henderson here. Monica Henderson is going to walk you through exactly how she navigated all of these topics, these key components when it comes to business, so that she can have a healthy flow, a healthy flow of clients that she loves serving. And that's what I'm going to be bringing more of. These themes and these interviews are going to be more around that topic of bringing you tips, tricks, strategies, mindset, all those different things, so you can have a healthy flow of consistent of consistent clients in a way that's aligned, in a way that's aligned with your heart's calling. So Monica Henderson, she's been an amazing part of the serving circle and a lot of you guys do know her. She has over 20 years experience when it comes to corporate executive, when it comes to being an entrepreneur, a coach, a consultant. Uh, she is a, an author. She's a creator of, um, of many, many things. One of them is as she's a founder of Mink Life Motivation. And she's just been an incredible part of my journey, especially in the, in the last year or so that uh, we've been introduced. And I love this topic. You're going to hear a lot of her story and how she navigated through these main topics. But some of the key takeaways, one, you're going to learn how to actually have confidence in the value that you give to people. Two, you're going to actually learn how to do your market research in a way that's fun, in a way that brings joy. It is a key component in terms of your business success. Three, you're going, to ha you're going to learn how to find your authentic voice and why it's so crucial when it comes to marketing. And four, how to be led by heartfelt service on all the journey and all these key components. You're going to get a lot of takeaways here. Let's dive in. All right, ladies and gentlemen, online family, welcome back to an episode of the Awaken Your Business podcast. You notice this face, you'll notice this voice. Monica Henderson has been in the community for a very long time and obviously served a lot, a lot of people in the community, whether they've been on her summits or her events or just got on a chat to network and connect people. It's just been an absolute pleasure to have her in here. And one theme that we're going to do coming up and, uh, and more frequently on the podcast is interviewing people who are already having a consistent flow of clients and doing it in a very way and do it in a way that's heart centered, do it in a way that feels aligned, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to implement a marketing tactic tool or strategy that feels heavy, that feels out of alignment. And so very first guest here I have is Monica. As soon as I put out the post to, uh, for people here, to jump on and talk about this. She's like, oh my God, I'm in. So here we go. Monica, I want to welcome you. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Awesome. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, we're here to just have a general chat about all the, the strategies, the tools and tactics that you felt aligned with, the things that you've been able to implement that might be a little bit different from things that you've seen or heard or, or some, of the, uh, you know, some of the things that are going around online. And also in terms of your mindset towards marketing, towards sales, towards business, I think that'll really help the listeners. And what's going to be, what's going to happen is people who are listening can start to tune into what they can implement in their business, what might feel exciting for them, what might feel expansive for them um, and things that they can implement into their own journey that might be able to help them have a flow of clients in a way that's aligned for them so they can get their gift out into the world. They can start serving at a new level. So I want to, just give you the space to share a bit about your story, your business, how you got to doing what you're doing so people can get to understand you who haven't heard you and heard you speak already. So go for it. Feel free to share. Yeah. So, you know, um, I think I was always destined to do what I'm doing, but it was definitely not obvious <laughs> in the beginning. So um, if I, I'm gonna take giant leaps in time. So we're gonna go back way far when I, mean, I my first 12 set, set years of in. my life. Right, first 12 years of my life, um, I suffered from crippling social anxiety. Um, and I could not speak to people outside of my family without having a panic attack. I literally felt like I was gonna die every time I would talk to a stranger. 
And that does not seem to resonate with people who know me now, <laughs> right? Because I'm very much a networker and very much out, you know, seemingly outgoing, but um, it was definitely a struggle. Um, the beautiful part about being so incredibly enclosed was I got to observe a lot of life and I got to learn a lot about people. So I had set a set of rules for myself. And um, I decided, had a conversation with myself and I was like, self, you never died when you had to do these things. When your mom, my mom's an extrovert, so she would push me to do all the things and I would be like, oh my God, but I was an obedient child, so I did it anyway. Um, but I never died. I thought I was going to die and I didn't. And so I was like, self, you know, you act like we're going to die every time, but you don't, you don't die. So maybe you should try and just make those situations happen for you, but choose the ones that you want to happen instead. So I know that seems like way far away as I was 12 when I had that conversation with myself, but it was the first time I realized that I could set the rules for my own life, that I didn't have to lean into my own fear and what was happening inside of me, but that I could actually change how I felt about the scenario at hand. Um, and so I was going into high school and I had my set of rules and they were funny rules too. They were like, don't get any tattoos until you're 24. Cause you know, adults are always talking about like, oh, I regret that I was young and stupid. Uh, and uh, do absolutely everything that makes you interest that you're interested in, even if it's not cool to your friends. Um, because I had heard so many adults talk about how they regret it not doing this or their friend talked them out of that and they wish they had of. Um, and um, other things like, you know, don't fall for boys you know, games or anything like that and do everything in the appropriate age. Um, because when you try to do things too young, uh, sometimes you end up making foolish mistakes. And so I had all these rules set up for myself and I was going to live my life. Sorry. I was going to live my life by these rules. And so, uh, so I did, I did just that. So when I went into high school, I literally joined almost every club that was interesting to me. I was on the volleyball team, I ran track, I was a cheerleader. I actually ended up being on homecoming court. So this kid who was completely shy set up some rules to, for my comfort and I was able to achieve a bunch of things that no one thought was ever possible for me. So I'm living on this set of rules and I keep living on this set of rules for a while and I hit about 24 and those rules no longer apply. I had out lived the rule set because that set was for my early adulthood, right? How I was going to come into adulthood, but it wasn't how I was going to live the rest of my life. So I found myself kind of spiraling a little, um, really unfocused. Uh, and then I had a set of tragedies, you know, happen that kind of clouded my judgment. And I, I, I think I'm thankful for those experiences because they gave me empathy because up until that point, I was able to wheel myself. So I, I just knew I had everything. <laughs> I, I don't understand why other people don't do this. All you have to do is will yourself. But in having that experience of like being lost and, and kind of detached a bit and not sure what the next step was uh, really helped me understand that uh, sometimes people make decisions from a, a veil of depression or a veil of, of, of emotion and it seems as though from that ex their experience that that's the right choice but from the outside looking in it's very obvious that that's not the right choice right and so so through that process i kind of found myself spinning and um making choices that were really kind of outside of who i really was and so um one of the protective rules that i put for myself was that i was never going to get married um, in that chaos time. And so, um, but I absolutely wanted a child. And so I went about getting, I'm um, having a baby and I went about trying to kind of live my life in this wonky set of rules that were not attached to who I really was. And I got nowhere fast, right? I would find some success and I would lose it really quickly. And I just couldn't find my footing. And so, uh, I had 
kind of started having this feeling of like, I got to get it together. It's time, like time's ticking. I need to really get my life together. And so I remember at the time I was dating this guy and he takes me to his spiritual center. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Agape International, uh, but it's um, really kind of a a spiritual center. So it's like non-denominational. It's not one particular religion. It's just a spiritual space. And I went on a date. So I thought I was being cute. Like, I was like, oh, well, I like this guy. So I'm gonna go hang out with this guy. Um, And you know, the universe nudges you in ways that you don't even realize. Right. And so I'm sitting in, you know, in the big spiritual center, there's about 300 people in the space. And I, um, I, grew up really religious so I had kind of ran from any formalized version of spirituality ever um I was like you know I was in church five days a week when I was a kid so I was like I don't know I'm not trying to do this church thing but there's a cute guy involved so <laughs> I'm just gonna go and hang out with this guy and so I'm sitting there in my cute dress with my makeup and my hair done and I'm feeling like oh yeah look at me I'm really growing up now and I'm making the, a, a, adult decisions and I'm sitting there and Michael Bernard Bethwick gets up and he starts talking and he's speaking directly to my soul so to the point where I forgot where I was, I forgot that there were 300 other people. I forgot about the dude sitting next to me that brought me there. And he was talking to me directly. And he was talking about one, reminding me of all the things that I knew, but then also reminding me that like, I am destined for bigger than what I've experienced, right? The little tiny life that I was living in was so much smaller than what my potential was. And that kind of spoke to me in a certain way. So then he started walking us through this meditation. And so he's walking us through the meditation. He's like, close your eyes and, and, you know, really kind of get comfortable. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I could do this. And he says, you know, every oak tree starts off as an acorn. And as enormous as these oak trees get, they start off so very tiny. But before they can become these large, massive, amazing trees, they first have to shed their shell. They have to go to chaos. And sometimes things have to fall apart so that they can grow into what they're supposed to be. And so I was like, okay, yeah, I feel you. I get it. And so he says, it's time for you to plant that acorn and nurture that acorn. So he walks us through a visualization of planting an acorn. And I'm like, oh, okay, we're going to do this. And I'm really visual. So in my head, I can see the inside of my soul somewhere inside of my body. And I'm digging a hole and I'm planting this acorn and I'm covering it up. And then he told us, uh, he's like, yes, I'm, you know, walking us through different affirmations. But the one that stuck with me as the game changer was he's like, I'm ready to fully live in my existence, come what may. And I know you know what that means, Tyson. (laughs) Oh, crap. Uh, So I say those words, I'm ready to live my full existence, come what may. I believe it. I'm crying, ugly cry at this point. Uh, And (laughs) and I, I finally kind of get like so into all of this that I, and I'm not at all kind of in awareness of what is happening around me because I'm fully in this spiritual flow. And I see all the things that I'm meant to be flash before my eyes in this visualization. I see myself successful. I see myself married, which is weird because I'm not supposed to get married. That's never, ever, ever thing, right? And I see myself really just living a fully joyful life. And I had never experienced so much love and joy ever in that way. It was so pure and so natural. And so he finally brings us out of our meditative space and we go back to do benediction and everything. And I'm still (gasps) ugly crying. I got tears everywhere and probably snot running down my nose. I mean, it was a real bad look. Uh, So much for being cute for a date, right? And so I look over um, to the guy who I was there with and he's like, are you okay? And I was like, no, that was the most amazing experience ever. And he's like, oh, well, I'm really glad that I brought you and that you had that kind of opening and it was touching for you. And I was like, thank you so much. I'm so grateful for it. So we leave there and within the next six months, everything in my life is uprooted. 
every single thing that was keeping me comfortable was gone. I, it started with my car breaking down and I didn't have enough money to fix it or buy a new one. So I had to move out of my house uh, quickly <laughs> because the neighborhood I lived in was not, was kind of in a rural part of, of, of California. And so it wasn't like I could just walk to the grocery store or walk to the next thing. It was really kind of necessary to have a car. So I borrowed a car from my godmother and I drove over to, you know, the local hardware store where they have day, work, day laborers there. And I found two guys with the truck and I was like, hey, can you patch walls and move me to uh, move me about 30 miles up the road one way? I'll pay you for the day. And they were like, sure. I packed my entire house up, threw it on their car, uh, on their truck and put it all in storage and proceeded to stay with my family, uh, with, a, with a friend of the family in her living room on a rollaway bed with my two-year-old. And so that was what seemed to be my bottom in the moment. But in reality, that was the beginning of the most perfect start to everything else that I wanted. Because all of the things that were so comfortable for me that kept me in just taking these same steps away from who I really was, was taken away from me, I was now at the point where I could just build whatever I wanted. I had nothing holding me back. There was no car, there was no house. It was just me, my baby, and $800 in my pocket. And I just had to figure it out. So I told a lie. It all starts with a lie. Uh, I told my friend that I was staying with that I was going to go out and find a job and if she could watch my daughter for the week. And I did not go look for a job. I went into a local discount store and I bought a notebook and a pen and I went, I marched myself to a park and I began to really try to understand what do I really want? What is it do I want? And the first three words came forward, healthy, wealthy, fulfilled. I just want that. That's all I want. I just want to be healthy. I want to be wealthy and I want to be fulfilled. And then I asked myself, what does that mean, <laughs> right? That's, the, that's a cute answer, healthy, wealthy, and fulfilled, but what does that mean? So the next day I came back to the park and I tried to figure out what healthy meant, what wealthy meant, and what fulfilled meant, which means I had to ask myself a lot of questions. Like, what do I need in order to be healthy? What does it feel like to be healthy? What kinds of activities do I need to be healthy? What do healthy relationships look like? What do healthy, just different types of health. There's not just that my body is healthy, but all the other parts of my life being healthy. And so I asked, I gave myself permission to ask stupid questions like, what kind of food do I need to eat in order to be healthy? It seems so obvious, right? We all know the food pyramid or we've all been told all these things, but I asked myself stupid questions. I asked myself, where do where can I live where I don't need a car that I, but I can get I have access to the to groceries and 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 really cool things and how can I live in a walking neighborhood so I get more exercise instead of being in the car often I asked myself real real questions and I asked myself what does it look like to be wealthy they saw, talk about diversified portfolio all the time I know you probably heard that a few times from financial planners what does that mean and how can I get one and is it just something for, for rich people? And what is rich anyway? And what do wealthy people have that I want, right? So I asked myself stupid questions that no one gives themselves permission to ask, but I asked them and I wrote them down. And I asked myself, what does it take for me to be fulfilled? What makes me tick? What makes me excited? What jobs did I have that really made me jump out of my skin because I was experiencing everything in flow? right? And I just wrote those questions after question after question. I wrote them all down. And then I proceeded to come back to the park for the last three days of the week and answer those questions, just answering them. And if I didn't have the answer, I researched it and I looked for it and I found the answers for them. And then from there, I had a basic blueprint of what I really, really wanted for myself. From there, I was able to build and that's exactly what I did. So I wrote a story about what I really wanted for myself based on the answers from those questions. And then I said, I'm only going to make decisions based on this story. 
nothing else. If it doesn't fit in this story, if it's a deviation from this story, then it's not, it's a no, it's a hard no. And so I put myself in uncomfortable situations, like being on a public bus for an hour and a half each way to go into the neighborhood that I needed to live in. And I put myself in a, in a position where my doctors and my school and everything was way further than where I was laying my head every night because that was the neighborhood that I, I wanted to be in. That was the story that I was going to be a part of. And I spent my time only walking toward what was important to me. Now, I walked you through that long, very long story uh, to, to get you to the understanding that every single thing that I did, I documented. And when I documented those things, when it came time four years later for me to look back at like where I came from and some of the paces I had went through in order to get there, it was blatantly obvious of what I did in order to be successful because I had a documentation of that process. And what I got in the end from reading that first story to where I was sitting when I reread that first story, I was sitting one block away from the building that I said I wanted to live in. Facing the same direction on the same floor that I said I wanted to live on. I had managed to meet and marry the love of my life and someone who truly supported who I was. My daughter was able to go to the best of schools without me having to pay anything just because I stuck to that plan. And I was living in the neighborhood that I wanted. I was doing what I wanted to do with my brain. I was being creative and also practical because I love the brainy processy crap. I mean, I'm really geeking out over over spreadsheets and, and PowerPoints over here. I, like it's a really geeky thing for me. And I got all of those things because I won. I sat down for a second and stopped, just stopped doing stuff. Stopped being active of trying to hurry up and keep things together and holding it together and protecting something that didn't belong to me anymore. And I allowed that to fall away. And instead I put a plan in place of what I really wanted. And everything I did at that point, even though it was hard, it wasn't the same kind of hard because I was doing, I knew I was walking towards my future. I knew I was walking towards what I wanted to achieve. And I knew that every time I won, I saw it closer. I saw it felt more real. It felt more normal. And so it was really kind of a beautiful moment when I was able to go back and read four years later oh, these are all the things I wanted. Check, 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 check. Even though I hadn't really visited that story since the moment I wrote it, you know? Um, so when it came down to my husband pushing me out of my new comfort zone, because by the way, people, we, we create comfort zones and then we work ourselves out of comfort zones and then we create a new comfort zone. So I had created a new comfort zone for myself. And my husband was like, it happened on a date uh, and it was the probably fourth time in a, in a row that we had a date and I was sitting in the corner with someone, a stranger, and they were crying and we were having a full Oprah moment off to the side of, of, of the restaurant. He would go to the bathroom, he'd come back and I'd be crying with a stranger and they'd be, <laughs> you know, ugly cry. <laughs> and I'm like, it's okay. And, then, and he'd walk over, your wife is so amazing and she helped me out so much. And he's like, hey, you can't keep doing this on our dates. Our relationship's not gonna make it. And really, they're not your friends. They're clients. You need to be making money from that. That is, they're not your friends. And so he pushed me out again. And that was when I started on the journey to create Mink Life Motivation. I took all of that experience of building my own life from nothing and walking through all of the documentation that I had made for how did I overcome being a homeless, jobless, single mother, right, to literally living the life that I want. And I had all of the documentation for it. So I went through and created a system based on that. And then I, I worked with therapists and um, 
really kind of I learned what it took to actually make that a healthy experience for someone else. So they, they didn't have to go through the pitfalls that I went through and created a, a training system called Mink Life Motivation Principles. And wow. so that's how it came to be. Awesome. I love the, uh, I love that you put in there the relationship with chaos. I, yes. think, I think the, uh, like I said, a lot of people are trying to protect certain things in their life and they're saying, Hey, I'm cool. Universe, God, whatever you want to call it. I'm cool for you to send things my way and I'm cool for you to guide along the way as long as you don't touch this part of my life right. as long as you don't as long as you don't mess with my money as long as you don't make me go broke or make me feel alone or make me feel not enough yeah. you're not allowed to touch that and and I think opening yourself up to whatever chaos is coming your way is letting in that guidance and it seems like yeah. that relationship you know from Michael Beckwith and his story of the acorn it's it's a it's a different relationship you have now with, with chaos and with yes. things that are unexpected, things that are unplanned, things that are unmanageable for your mind and, and welcoming that in. So everyone should take note of that, first of all. Um, second of all, in terms of the business building, once you started Mink Life Motivation, you started talking to these psychologists and therapists and having yes. people transition that. How did you go from having that as an idea to f first of all, getting clients and, and, and making money out of this. Was there, what, what was that transition like? Yeah. So um, it started with not being scared to ask even the people who are closest to us. Right. So for me, I, I had this system that I went through and there was, there's some other principles that kind of are, are in there that I was like, I think this is the same for other people. Like, I don't think this is just a me thing. I think other people are feeling this too. And so I started asking questions of people just in general. And it was, what's interesting is, uh, so if you have a Facebook page with, I don't know, 200 people on it and they kind of like you a little bit, they are great market research. They're willing to give you all kinds of information, uh, answer your questions. And so I would literally just post a random question that would seem random to everybody else around me. But for me, it was really, I was looking for a specific, um, I, had, I had a very specific kind of reasoning why I was asking the questions. And I would just ask questions. Did you, have you ever experienced this? And what was your experience life, uh, like when, you, when this happened for you? And people would be so open and honest about how they were experiencing things. And I was like, awesome, noted. And I would see some similarities in their answers, right? And I'm like, okay, so that must be some sort of truth for the people who are answering. There might be more here. And I just kept asking questions. And to this day, I ask questions like there's no tomorrow. Um, the one thing that I think most people should embody quickly, if you could, if I can teach myself earlier to do this, I think I probably would have been a lot further faster. And that is enjoy the things that you hate about business, right? Mm -hmm. Including negative feedback, right? The more you can get stoked about when someone gives you net negative feedback, the faster you can actually develop your products, develop your programs, develop your system. Because when someone says, oh, that was great, there's nothing to learn there, uh. right? But if someone says, you know, it didn't really do it for me. If you keep like, yes, awesome. Okay, so tell me why it didn't do it for you and get excited about getting that information back, they're gonna tell you exactly what to fix, what to tweak, what works, what didn't work. And I just got so comfortable in negative feedback and asking for it, like, well, what didn't work for you? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, it's great, awesome. But what, what, what sucked about it, you know? And really just leaned into hearing that and being in gratitude of the negative feedback. Most of us don't do that, right? Most of us say, oh, well, that person just has an attitude problem or that person just doesn't get it. But that person is exactly the person who's giving you the feedback you need in order to tweak something so that it's better. Yeah. The people who just root you on, 
and don't actually give you any negative feedback or anything to work on from that, you stay in comfort there. But when someone says, I don't like this, and you ask them, okay, well, why don't you like that? And how could it be better the faster you get to that point? Um, and so, you know, I technically, my business is a year and six months, old, six this months old, right? But I've built so much in just one year, but it was because I was so excited about negative feedback. I was like, please break my system, break it. I, I, I try the training system and tell me where it sucks. I need to know. Um, because that was where I got to fix it. So I had lots of therapists. I'm like, I created this program and I'm not sure it's good. Can you just take a course and tell me what you think? What's the feedback? What, what sucks about it? How, how, how does it let my client down? How does it not give you what I'm saying it's going to give you? And they were so honest with me and they actually even came over and above with the feedback and said, this isn't, this isn't, doing what you want it to do, but what it is doing is this. So then I got an opportunity to say, oh, well, I'll still keep this, but maybe I'll tweak it or I'll not put this here. Maybe I'll move it over here. And those kinds of tweaks actually made the system work really well. So we have a really high um, conversion rate of people saying, oh my God, that's amazing. But I've only had like maybe of a hundred people, maybe three or four say, eh, it was okay, <laughs> which is a great ratio, right? It's a great ratio. And even when I asked them why it wasn't okay, it wasn't necessarily that the program itself wasn't okay. They just didn't find an application for themselves in it. And that's okay too. Yeah. Cause it's not for everyone. It's only for people who it's for. And so. Oh, so I want to, I want to tap in here because what people are noticing is that you've gone from a, a kid who's got a lot of social anxiety to one who's, looking for and excited about negative feedback and that's, yeah. a, that's a huge shift that is a that is a massive yeah. shift but what you're highlighting here is a couple key elements that people really need for their for their business growth there's just really a couple things we need to do really well obviously the market research is a key piece and it's one that not a lot of people are spending time doing mm -hmm. um, but the fact you were actually willing to ask some you know, strategic questions to a group of kind of people that might answer it, that might not. And just start there is it's inspiring because many people are trying to figure out certain answers without going down the path of putting in the time to do the research. So what, what would you recommend if someone's like, Oh, I'm not too sure on my niche. I'm not too sure what to say. I'm not too sure what they want, I'm not too sure on the challenges they're, they're facing. How can people get started with, with just doing some research, with getting some things out there and starting to notice the patterns that you started to notice as well? Yeah, uh, it's consistency. Um, that's probably gonna be the answer for all the things, <laughs> consistency. I consistently asked questions. I consistently put things out there. And what I noticed is at first people were reluctant to answer, but then after a while they were excited to answer. And so it really was consistency of putting the information out there and then also you got to be a scientist in your business. And I know that's not necessarily some people's favorite subject, but it is all about experimentation. And so you've got to be comfortable with failing out loud and publicly. And I know that's like the opposite of cool. <laughs> it's the opposite of cool, right? It's, no one wants to do that though. with your life. <laughs> it's the new but, thing. But I, I really do you know, even with my team now, like I have a full team that supports my, my marketing and supports the program and all of my operations, right? And even with my team, they will come in with their own fears about not looking cool in public. And I'm like, listen, you're doing it on my dime. I'm okay to fail publicly because it's a learning lesson for someone uh, and a learning lesson for me, right? And so if I fail and say, oh yeah, that didn't work. Let me tell you why so you don't have to do it. Then it becomes another lesson that I'm teaching someone and that's valuable too. And so I just got really comfortable with sucking publicly. Um, just, it's okay that like my first live show cause I started a, a, a live streaming show on Facebook and the first one, when I go back and watch the first one, it was cringy. And I was so, you, you, I could see the social anxiety uh, things that I try to hide really well, um, just kind of coming forward. And I went back to 
you know, flash back to childhood when they would ask me to read out loud in public and I'd be like, oh my God, and I'd stutter over the words and I couldn't figure it out and I'm panicky and the whole thing. And the first episode looked just like that, super awkward. And now when you watch the show, it just looks like I'm hanging out with my friends and we're having a good time and we're talking about business and it's great. So I remember when I hired the producer for the show and she's like, well, it's a little... Are you sure you want to promote this out to people? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. Because they will see the journey. They will come along with the journey with me and it'll be what it'll be. But ultimately I can't wait for it to be awesome before I get the word out. Because by the time it's awesome and I'm trying to get the word out, it's too late. I got to do it now. So if you're trying to put together a program, put it out there. So what if it's not perfect? Because the perfect comes from practice. The perfect comes from experience. The perfect comes from you trying it, it not working quite as what the way you want to saying, okay, well, why didn't that work the way that I want to? Let me tweak it to see if this will get it there. And then it'll get there. The first one, you know, first episode had like all too many topics in it and too many stuff. It was like all over the place. Now it's very streamlined and we can kind of get in and out. I don't even have to prep for it as much anymore because it really follows a formula that we created in the process of just doing it. So you got to fail publicly and you got to do it consistently all the time. Oh, you got a new program that you're trying to beta? Awesome. Put it out today. It's not ready. That's okay. Put it out today. It's going to take time for people to get it. It's going to take time for people to even know it exists. It's going to take time for people to even see it. You got to tell them eight times before they can actually, before they'll actually buy into anything, right? You got to say it out loud to them and ask them eight times. So if you're waiting until you're good eight times, you've lost all this momentum when they could have been ready for you and are willing to give you the feedback. Yeah, That's the thing. I hear, I hear that one thing that I have also been implementing is when someone comes into your inner circle, when someone comes in, into your program and someone jumps on board as a client is to set some, I set some, some foundations, but one of them is, um, one thing I heard from Jay Abraham is, is to um, respect me enough to tell me when something is going wrong. Yes. And I think that's one of the, one of the things that, you know, especially moving forward, I'm going to start be doing more often is, is having so that that negative feedback is, is in place is to let them know that's what I'm after. And mm -hmm. please, please respect me enough um, to let me know if there is something wrong, if there are different ways in which you, you know, your expectations weren't met whatever it may, may be so that I can, you know, be resourceful yeah. in, in solving that. But my question for you would be after all of this research, after you got the feedback, after you started putting things out there to test and tweak super mm -hmm. important parts, how did that go from that to start onboarding, paying clients and putting yourself out there in a big way in marketing? What, what did that process look like? It literally was, they, they went through it. First of all, I, I asked them with passion in the beginning, like, hey, I got this new program. I'm so excited about it. I really would love for you to try it. And I asked them to pay, you know, in the beginning. <laughs> like, I didn't wait until it was good to ask. I asked them to pay in the beginning. A lot of the times we want to, like, give away free stuff and we get stuck in the free zone for a long time. Um, but I asked, I was like, look, this is how much I'm thinking it's a value. Um, and I would love for you to pay this. And if it needs to be in payment plans, or if you're not sure you want to do half up front and half later, then that's cool too. Um, but once they did it, then they were like, I want more and I want more. And so then it just became a snowball effect. Um, with the conferences, it was, it was the same thing. I think 90% of it is really just the, the passion behind the person who's asking. Mm right? How sure is the person that's asking? Like, if you're not sure it's worth the amount of money you're asking, then it's definitely going to send the energy of that, that vibrant, that frequency to that person. Like, oh yeah, no, this ain't worth it. Right. But when I got super sure that my pricing was ever, like, this was a good value and I'm giving you more than you even realize that this is valuable. And I get it. If you discount me in the beginning, you think, oh, well, okay, I'll, I'll do it, but I don't know. So I'm going to show it to you on the other side. I was so passionate from that side that when it came time to ask, I didn't flinch or hum or okay, well, but you're going to have to pay me some money in order to do this. I was able to stand in my power and my confidence. And that was really kind of the kicker 
as long as I'm comfortable with that price that I'm saying out loud and the value that I'm giving and, and what I know I can do, then it was just after that, it wasn't a problem. I don't have a problem with p asking people to uh, pitch into the community. I don't have a problem asking people to pay for licensing. I don't have a problem with asking people to pay to be a strategic partner um, because I know the value that I can provide them. And even if it doesn't exist yet, I know it's coming. I'm so confident in the vision that I have for my business that I know it's coming. And I know that I'm going to do everything in my power to give them that value. Yeah. What do you, what do you think it is about, what do you think is unique about the process that you've put in place there, whether it be the research, whether it be the, the getting the feedback, the delivery on, um, you know, having them say that they want more. What do you think is unique about your process that's allowed you to succeed and to get this, this level of momentum and this, this level of success that most people might be missing? What do you think that is? I was never attached to the results. Mm. Right. So the result that I'm looking for is not quantifiable right now. I'm looking to build a business that is a legacy business that lives on beyond me. And so I can't be attached to the results right now. It's just about getting out there and putting the work in because money follows excellence, period. If it's excellent, they will come. Even if someone is not excellent and people pay a lot of money for it, they won't come back, right? But if they come and it's excellent, they will keep coming back. And I think that was probably more evident um, for people when they started seeing my conference, because that was like a quick way for them to see who I am um, and what I'm about and what the concept of Mink Life Motivation as a community is, an ecosystem, if you will, that supports entrepreneurs. When they came into the conference space, I was dogmatic about showing them that this is what it's like to be in my world. In my world, everyone's an expert from their own zone of genius. And in my world, we're collaborative partners. And in my world, we're all one tribe and everyone eats and everyone supports each other. And I wanna, I wanna build, I'm creating a world that I wanna live in. And so when I got so geeked out about my vision being exactly that and executing that and not being attached to how much money it took or how much money it made, but really just felt like creating excellence, then even when I had missteps or when things didn't work right, right there was a few times that PowerPoints had misspellings or, uh, you know, Zoom just kicked people out, right? Yeah. <laughs> they were so much more forgiving and willing to come back, even though there was some things that weren't perfect, right? And so it really is kind of detaching yourself from the right now and really kind of staying true to the bigger, broader vision of what it is that you want, which is the same thing I did for my life, right? Like I, it, I had, had to detach from what is, feels good right now and stay focused on what I was building in that story. And it's the same thing for your business. I have to keep vision of I'm trying, my mission is to help millions of professionals worldwide change their lives and grow their businesses. So if that's the case, then I have to stay focused on that vision and I have to stay focused on what it would take in order to get there. And the outcome is not my business. That's the, that's the universe. That's God. That's our creator. That's the energetic force. However you want to call it, that, that ain't my business. My business is to show up, do my due diligence and make it possible for the universe to support me. Mm. Right. And I can't be attached to who gets attached to that? I can't celebr celebritize anybody. I love Tyson, but if Tyson's like, yeah, Monica, I'm out. I can't do any more conferences. I can't be devastated behind that because the universe has a bigger plan for him and a bigger plan for me, right? And so I just have to stay focused on what my job is and not care about the outcome because what the universe has for me has for me. And I just have to keep doing my diligence and creating the space for the universe to show up. That's cool. And that's such a, it's such an empowering vibration to be putting out there because people can feel that people can feel in your, when you're running your conferences and you have all these, all these speakers who are delivering and you have these people who are um, jumping on board as, as 
power partners and collaborative partners and, and um, you know, and connecting you with new people through their network, like they can tell that you don't have the attachment. Compare that with someone who, who might be attached and you can feel it in their marketing, in their messaging, in their communication, um, that they need something from you so that they can feel enough or they can feel seen, they can feel worthy. And that's, completely there is there something in in terms of the way you communicate whether it be your messaging whether it be your offer whatever it is is there something that you is there something that you do or you put in your in your marketing in your communication to make sure that there's not that neediness or is, or does that just flow through with your vibration um uh it's, it's again kind of being attached to what your who you are and what your business is um it's really about your authentic voice, right? So when you have a true authentic voice for your brand, my brand is fun, professional, um, quirky, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, inclusive, connected. And so the words that I use and even how I ask is really from all of those places, being from a place of contribution as opposed to as a place of, 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 um, of you know asking right it's it's really like i want to give i want to serve and so when i'm talking about the conference i really heavily lay them like listen i want to be of service to you and this is the best way that i could be of service to you i network heavily i can't tell you how many coaches i talk to on a weekly basis i have 25 calls one-to-one -one calls with new people on a regular basis so it's impossible for me to directly refer 25 different life coaches who are Reiki healers, right? It's impossible for me to do that. And so for me, it's like, well, the best way that I can serve you directly is by putting you as a part of this platform and pushing all of us out there. And so even in how I talk about the conference, even though they're paying to be a part of that experience, it's also still organic to who I am and what I'm building, which is I'm coming from a place of contribution. This is about all of us coming together. This is about all of us growing together. And so when I give them the price point, which is not expensive, they're like, oh yeah, no, I definitely want to be a part of this. I'm in, here's my money. And it's not hard. I don't sell anything. I just offer up this is how i can contribute if that's a useful way for you to do it that's great and if it's not it's okay too i still want to support you i'll still join your facebook group i'll still like your post you know i'll still be able to support you in some other ways and if i run across someone who just so happens to you, your name pops up in my head when i'm talking to them i will definitely still do that connection but ultimately the kind of networking i do i do is, is so hard and so with the conference space, I just say, hey, look, this is the best way that I can showcase you. This is the best way that I can put your name out there and put you in front of all the people that I know, because I'm inviting all the people that I know into this conference. And so it's, it's, it really is um, just making sure that everything is organic to what you are building and, and making it live in an ecosystem, just like any other ecosystem. If something doesn't fit, it can destroy the whole thing. Um, right. So like if you put a banana peel in a place where bananas don't belong, it can, you know, completely get wipe out the, the population of animals. Right. It's the same thing in your business. You got to create it like an ecosystem and everything must fit in that space. And so even our sales process, um, funny story. So I just had a cry with my with my business coach a couple of weeks ago, like a real like, oh, my God, I'm so sad, like cry because I realized that I will never have an automated business. I will never have the opportunity to just have a bunch of videos and people pay $49 to access a, a library and that be the end of our interaction. And I'm gonna make $20,000 overnight, which is something you hear all the time, right? Like, I don't know how many people are selling those programs. And I, I would love to be so simple and have something just like that. But based on what my business model is and the program that I've built and the ecosystem that I've created, we will never be able to provide that at the same level as everything else is. And so I just had to realize that I'm not going to be able to do that. Now, all of my friends who are part of the ecosystem can do that, right? But it won't be my part. And I had to I literally cry. I was literally crying 
with my business coach because I was like, it's the death of simplicity, wow. you know, like, but then by the end of the conversation, I realized that that is a plus. There are so many people who just want to talk to a person and that's what we offer. Right? And so, you know, the minute I got over my, my own sadness about not being able to be like everybody else and just have a little, like a simple way for people to go through a program and not have to deal with me at all to actually um, leaning into what mine is in its unique way. And I realized, wait, that's a plus. People do want to be around people and people do want to talk to people and people do want to be a part of a, of a community that actually has people that they can talk to at any time. And so, um, so it really is about kind of making sure everything's organic to what your business is, yeah. including the sales process, including the onboarding process, including everything that you add to it. And, and people will tell you, you'll, you'll know instantly when it doesn't feel good. Cause they'll be like, nah, this, this isn't working for me. <laughs> It'll be literally the, the bottleneck where everybody gets stuck. That doesn't fit. That but what you're coming from is a place of value. Like you truly do know there's so many takeaways here that people can have if they're looking to build a more consistent flow within their business, more consistent flow of, of clients or collaboration partners or whatever it is that you, you're so good at. You know, there are a lot of takeaways here. And one of that is that value. It's just like, I recognize how much value you're getting. Therefore the sales process becomes easy. It becomes mm -hmm. effortless. It becomes, it, it's coming from a vibration of contribution because you're getting so much more than what you invest in here. Yes. And I think that's one of the, one of the main takeaways. So before we, before we finish up here, I've got a couple of questions. One, where people can connect with you best so they can reach out and they can, uh, they can add you to their network if they haven't already. If they have, mm -hmm. obviously they're holding on to you and they're like, Oh my God, this, this person's amazing for your network. But if they haven't, where can they reach out to you? Where can they find out more about you and Mink Life? Yeah. So funny thing I've Googled, um, I had someone Google me recently and they said, apparently I show up. If you Google Monica M Henderson, all of my stuff sh shows up, but the fastest way to get to me and all of my social media links is on www.monica m as in marie henderson.com um there are all of my social media links and all of the businesses and a little bit about me and all those other things um and i love to connect with people and i love to um add new friends to my to my circle because you just never know who's sitting there with like this amazing value on the other side of the of a of a friend requests. So I, I accept people as friends and, and I trust them until they can't be trusted anymore. And then we re remove them. <laughs> so, um, so that's a great way. Um, I will also provide a calendar link and feel free to hop on my calendar at any time. I'm literally open all the time to have new conversations with people. So awesome. I'll put the, I'll put those links in the, in the description, in the show notes and things like that for people to reach out. Um, but is there anything else that you want to add in here? Any other, any other quick tips, uh, that we can add in here to make this conversation feel complete? Yeah, actually the last little piece that I would say is really tap into your, like find a tribe and tap into it. Um, though I cannot attribute any of my success over the last year and a half to Monica just being awesome. It literally took people like Tyson who had communities and who I was able to talk to. And he's like, Oh yeah, I think I know people come to come into my tribe. And I came into his tribe and tried to be a place of contribution for him. The same thing with Terry Lee. I came into her tribe and tried to be a, a support and a contribution for them. So really just create finding groups that can support you and surround you and that are like-minded. I, I always say that uh, the serving circle is my own personal watering hole. And I, I hate having to advertise in it because I'm like, no, I'm just here for my soul. Mm -hmm. I don't need to, I don't need to work here. Um, but it, even in that, it has been super uh, beneficial in making strong connections with people who are like me. And when they're like you, they tend to vibe with your vision, your mission and what you're about. And they'll want to support you, whether it's just sharing a post or um, invite and introduce you to someone so 
we can't do anything without other people. Um, it's impossible and no one's going to find you in your living room and come hand you money. So you might as well find a tribe of people who you can deal with on a long-term basis and really just kind of work with that. I, I could not have found any of the success that I had without a tribe like that. Beautiful. Yeah. It's such a good reminder. It's why I built my tribe and you know, and why I continue to expand. And I think it's a really good reminder, but there's so many cool key tips here. So everyone's going to want to reach out, add, add you to their network. Cause obviously as a networker, your, your network expands as a byproduct exponentially. So I love having you in the serving circle, love being in your network and, uh, and working with you moving forward. It's just, it's just been a pleasure so far. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and uh, I look forward to our next chat. That's for sure. Yes, that's for sure. Thank you so much, Tyson. My, my pleasure. My pleasure.